Welcome to the NACA American Dream Program. Each week, we'll talk about how NACA is revolutionizing mortgage lending with the best mortgage in America. It's no down payment, no closing cost or fees, no PMI, no consideration of your credit score. And guess what? It's at a below market fix rate. NACA is just relentless. This is the NACA way. Hey, hey, welcome back. Welcome back for another episode of NACA's American Dream Program, where NACA is doing what nobody else is doing. NACA is relentless when it can help people who have low, moderate, bad credit scores get a house. There is nobody on the strip of the, the banking strip that can help them get a house. How do I know? Because I'm one of them with a 480 credit score and a 2.23 30-year fixed interest rate. NACA is relentless, so we we are doing it. NACA is doing it. We're back. We're back. Welcome back. Glad to see you guys on this Monday morning. Hey, we have an awesome show for you guys. We just want you to sit back, relax, enjoy the information, and we have some very important information that we want to share with you that we want you, the community, the NACA community, and the world to be involved in. But first, I always got to say, hey, Anjanette, what's going on over there? How's the weather in Texas? How was your weekend? Oh! Damien, hey, 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 <laughs> my to my Nacolodians out there. It is a beautiful day out here in the world of NACA. Today is a beautiful day in Texas, Georgia, Florida, Minnesota, Mississippi, you name it, it's a beautiful day. Why? Because this is the, the NACA American Dream Program. This is the day that you can get out there and be looking for your home. And guess what? It's a beautiful day to be shopping for a home. And at a 2.125 on a 30-year fix mm. and a 1.375 on a 15-year fix, you can't beat that with a stick. Poke me because I'm done right there. <laughs> so I tell you, this is the day that we can manifest and enjoy all of the benefits and programs and, and services that NACA has to offer. This is a special segment because we are embraced with our CEO and we don't often, we don't have that often. So when we get our CEO to take time out of his day, um, because he's out there trying to really think of innovative and creative ways to provide more services out there to you. So when we get the opportunity to have Bruce Marks on the show, we got to make a big deal out there. So out there in Facebook land, throw them hearts up and let us hear because we have the man with the master plan right here. And guess what? Throughout this show, do not hesitate to reach out to us at 833-771-0500. That's 833-771-0500, where we will be taking your calls, questions, like us, love us, do what you want to do with us on our social media channels. But Damien, Bruce Marks is here. Can you believe that? And wow. Awesome news hey, we got the man himself on the today. The man with the master plan. So without further ado, I bring to you the CEO and founder of Neighborhood Assistance Corporation of America, Bruce Marks. Throw them hearts up, everybody. <laughs> and yet, Damien, everybody, it's great to be on. Great to be on. Welcome, oh, welcome. Wow. I hear you have some interesting information that you want to share with us. So what's yeah. going on? What is NACA doing out there? We need to know what's going on. So look, guys, uh, you know, you know, I started NACA 36 years ago. So, you know, one of the things that we pride ourselves is that we're always uh, addressing the needs of, that affect low, moderate income um, minority people. So we've always, you know, been ahead of the curve in doing that. So, you know, we started out on the mortgage stuff. We did the home save, you know, where all those homeowners were at risk of foreclosure. We did the modifications around that. And we've always continued to build the purchase side. But, you know, we want to see, you know, what's affecting our membership. So we knew as a result of the pandemic that, you know, it was a crisis out there. Clearly, you know, people were really impacted in a lot of ways. So we said, okay, what is the most important thing that we can do to really help people who are, are impacted by the pandemic? So we looked first to see, okay, if someone is a homeowner, 
just like during the mortgage crisis, are they at risk of foreclosure? And yes, there's some people that are risk of foreclosure, mm. but what the servicers and lenders learn out of, you know, from 2008 on during the mortgage crisis was it makes no sense to add additional payments on to a mortgage payment. So when someone comes back to work, they're gonna have a higher payment, which they cannot afford and the inevitable result would be foreclosure. So you think that makes common sense that they would do that that they wouldn't do that, but they didn't do that during the mortgage crisis. And so, you know, there, during that time period, 2008 through 2012, over 3 million, mostly African-American wow. homeowners lost their homes. Mm -hmm. And they didn't need to lose their homes. And who, you know, purchased those properties? What was Wall Street? It was the yeah. hedge funds. That's right. You know, it was invitation homes and those players out wow. there because now they're the biggest landlords in the country. And for example, Invitation Homes owns, owns 82,000 single family homes, wow. 82,000. Every <laughs> one of those homes used to be owner occupied, everyone. And the predominantly, and they most of them were owned by minority homeowners, people of color <laughs> who lost their homes, but now they're tenants. So the so what happened is they, at least the lenders and the investors learned. So we don't have nearly as many people at risk of losing their homes who are homeowners because now what they do is a forbearance. So if someone cannot make their mortgage payment for 12 months, they take the 12 months and they add it on to the end of the mortgage. So instead of having a 360 month mortgage, you have a 372 month mortgage, but your payment stays the same. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. So we don't see a tsunami coming for homeowners. There's still a number of homeowners who are at risk and we're still out there helping those homeowners. But now let's talk about tenants because so many of those homeowners became tenants uh, as a result of the mortgage crisis. And obviously, we, we have, because there is, we are a historically low percentage, low number of homeowners of people of color. So our membership is predominantly tenants going through the mortgage process, you know, but they're tenants. So what do we do? So we see, okay, there's this, more, this tenant crisis coming down, coming down. So we reach out to the Department of Treasury of the federal government, CFPB, the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau with the federal government and HUD. And we did this early in the year. And we said, you know, you've got to help the tenants. Well, the good news is they put aside $47 billion, $47 wow. billion dollars to help tenants. That's, a lot. That's the good news. The bad news is they said, you're on your own, figure it out. So they approved over 500 providers for the emergency rental system, over 500. But they didn't sell it, but every one of the 500, virtually no one knew how to administer it. They never did this before. And the federal government provided virtually no guidance of how to do that. You know, they put some guidelines, but they didn't set up systems. They didn't do anything to really facilitate this. They said, you're on your own. And, you know, and so some of them, you know, they really tried early on trying, you know, build systems, but they're, each one of them has a different system. Each one of them has different criteria. Right. And they were overwhelmed and, you know, they never did it before. So now you have, you know, people in, in, in all these states saying, you know, how do I, how do I get to the systems, both tenants and also some landlords? because there are some landlords that want to do the right thing and help their tenant. There are some landlords who look at it as an opportunity to evict tenants and jack up the rents. So now you have all these programs out there in really 50 states and tenants don't know how to access it. Landlords don't know how to access it. And it is a shit show out there. And you put the blame squarely on the federal government who didn't provide the oversight, 
the structure or the mechanism for these states to do it. So now we're back to the state. So what, what does NACA do? So we see that the Department of Treasury is not going to do the right thing. CFPB, none, none of them are going to do the right thing. So we said, okay, we see this coming down. So we hire economic justice advocates, EJAs. So what's the role of the EJA? Just like in the mortgage crisis, the EJA uh, works with uh, the tenant in the mortgage crisis with the homeowner and to really to help that tenant submit an application to the right uh, provider for the economic justice for the you know, the emergency rental assistance. So they help the tenant do the application and then they stay on with that tenant to ensure that they get the emergency rental assistance. So we did this during the mortgage crisis where we helped over 250,000 homeowners save their home. So now we're doing this during this tenants crisis. But as, as effective as our EJAs are, well, it requires advocacy, just like in the, the mortgage crisis. Because what do we do during the mortgage crisis? When I demonstrate everything, you 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 held nothing back. You took so, it by storm. So when Jamie Dimon, head of Chase Bank, right, when he refused to help the homeowners, what do we do? Well, we you know we have an event in Stanford, and he lives in his he lives close to Stanford. Uh, but he lives in, uh, you know, this, uh, this estate. He lives in, in, a, in a state which is really surrounded by a fence, you know, a 12 foot high fence. And it's a multiple of uh, buildings. So it's not just one building, but it's on a hill and it's on a lake. So we organize and we're bringing, you know, 3,000 people from the event to, to his home. And then what we do is we buy rafts. We buy rafts because we, we used to figure out, well, we're gonna have to do an amphibious assault on Jamie Dye to hold them personally accountable. So, you know, we buy the raft, but you know, you just can't bring them at the day of the action. So we're burying the rafts two a days before uh, the action. And, you know, his uh, security people see us and then, uh, but, we're bigger and meaner than they are. So we chased them off and, you know, he didn't want to get into a fight with, with NACA and he settled and he ended up modifying the mortgages for Chase Barlow's. So that's what we do there. So we take that same uh, stance and, you know, say, well, you know, we've got to hold these providers accountable. So we talked to the, to the EJA staff and we say to, and we talk to obviously the tenants and say, who's the worst ones out there? We're, we're, who are the worst providers out there? And they say, you know, one of the worst, if not the worst is the Georgia, Georgia Department of Community Affairs. Georgia Department of Community Affairs. And, you know, they are head by, headed by Christopher Nunn. <laughs> And so we said, okay, well, we're going to make, you know, them the first target, not the only target, but the first target, because they administer over, uh, over a billion dollars of the emergency rental system. But NACTA has over 3 million members. And you know where our members are? Our members are everywhere. Some of our members are cleaning the homes of, um, you know, of uh, the executives. Some of our members are taking care of the CEO's children. Some of the members work in big government uh, entities, such as the, the Georgia Department of Community Affairs, DCA. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they're telling us inside what's going on. Because we're everywhere. Because, and so what they're telling us is that, you know, that they're overwhelmed, that, you know, that they're a backlog actually till you know august i mean people are losing their home their apartments they're being evicted and they can't process these applications so i said okay well we're going to take them on so we do a demonstration a couple of weeks ago uh in front of in front of dca 
And, you know, we had over 300 tenants there. And what's good about being right there is that it's right by the state house. Now, now that's the good news. The other side of it is, is that it's also on federal property. We have to deal with the state police and, you know, they're right. a, bit more, a bit more aggressive. Mm-hmm. But with 300 people, we go into the lobby, we take it over, and we make our presence heard big time. And then some of the state reps come on out and they support us and they say, okay, all of a sudden, uh, Christopher Nunn is called before a hearing with the state reps to say, what's going on? And so, you know, as a result of what we did, they changed some of their policy. So now they are, you know, they reallocated some of the monies to some of the better providers who are doing a much better job in providing the rental assistance, getting the money out. They've changed some of their, um, their policies where they can do a self attestation uh, mm-hmm. that they're impacted by COVID-19. So we've, we've already had a huge impact, but it's not good enough because there's still a backlog. There's still people at risk of eviction And so we're going to continue to do that. Now, one of the things we've done is that we have gotten a lot of data on what's going on inside. So currently what's going on is that they've had over 40,000 applications, over 40,000. They have only processed one third of those 40,000. And out of the ones that they have processed, they have denied half of them. How can that be? How can you only process one third of the application? And how can you deny 50%? This is their own data. This is their own data that that we're getting. So the fact of the matter is, and, and what's even worse is that the courts have gotten more efficient. So while the providers are, you know, over their heads are, uh, are just not processing things in a timely manner, and frankly, making poor decisions as, as a result, you know, that's on one side. On the other side, the courts have said, we're going to speed up the process. We're going to speed up the eviction oh, no. process. But that was one of my favorite moments of this season. Oh my God. And, and Maria is turning red over here. <laughs> right. <laughs> He's in on me for real. I'm like, oh my God. Honey, what I think you need is a socket wrench. I played JV basketball. I'm sorry. I don't think it looks right. This is good, and it's all good, baby. Is it really all good? If you love me enough to routinely test your handyman skills, not to mention the strength of your marriage, then of course you'll visit nhtsa.gov slash the right seat to make sure I'm in the right car seat. I'm gonna call my dad. Okay, I keep on saying self-reflection, but it's true, this is what I really think. How do you recognize uh, what you can do based off of what you want to do. Come on, being honest with yourself. How can I, how can I fit this into my schedule? I think it's really being honest with yourself. And if you are in a, like a hierarchy kind of organization, being honest with the people that manage you and are over you. So, you know, the consequences of that are so many people are being evicted from their apartments. Now, we thought with the, the, the EJAs, you know, their job is to make things better for DCA and for the providers. So we thought in a 
kind of romantic idea. Well, they don't have to fund it. We haven't asked for any money. We're not asking for, for any money. It's on NACA's dime. It's NACA's paying for it. So we said, okay, you know, to help with this process, we're going to help people apply. So they're going to, we're going to help get all the documents and the information from the tenants so that they can submit a complete application. And if there are things that, you know, DCA, for example, needs, well, they can contact our EJA and our EJA can assist them, you know, the tenants in getting that information. So it's an added resource. It's not a duplication, it's an added resource. Well, you would think that they would open, you know, you know spread their arms and give us a hug and say, thank you very much for, um, for the, you know, added exactly help. exactly yes as the problem, not as the, the problem. Well, you know, because, you know, they don't like, you know, Christopher Nash doesn't like to be held, held accountable, right? You know, he wants to go to his nice home, of which we visited, and we had a nice conversation with his wife. And so we'll be back there, you know, wow. because we, we, we believe that, you know, it's personal that, you know, tenants should have the opportunity to personally present their case to the decision maker. We've done this. Uh, we've we, we've done this for the bank executives. We've done it for when we we had a war going on with Senator Phil Graham back when, and all these guys. You know, we want to connect the you know the people, the decision makers, to the people who they are impacting. So where does that lead us now? Well, NACA is leading the charge on the. Tenants rising campaign. Tenants rising. Now, how do you address the issue around tenants rising? Well, some tenants, you know, you know, paying high rents. It's ridiculous what the rents are. Mm -hmm. Obscene. Well, if someone wants to say, I'm good being a tenant, well, then you know, we're gonna advocate for that tenant and their family to make to have an affordable rent and stay in their apartment. But also we're going to help in tenants rising tenants to be a homeowner on NACA's best in America mortgage. And you can do both at the same time. You can participate in our purchase program, best in the country, and you can participate in our tenants rising campaign to make sure that you have a place to live that's safe, that's affordable and you're not at risk of eviction. Bruce, I have a question. Yes. With that. Yeah, so so just so I'm clear, so everybody can hear, because I want to make sure everybody gets this, that this is what I'm hearing. What you're saying is they can go through the purchase process and still apply for rental assistance and come through and getting rental assistance over here and also apply for the home purchase program so they can get in a home that they own? Is that what you're saying? That's, is that what I hear you saying? Yes, 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 Damien. You, I, everybody, I, do y'all hear what he just said? And it's Go paramount. Go get rental assistance <laughs> as well as get in the NACA program to now purchase your own home. That's what you said, right, uh, Bruce Marks? Is that what yes, I hear you said? But, but, but I'm going to say it's even better than that. Oh, that, go that, ahead. That, I'm that, ready. Better than that. Because you know on the purchase side that we don't look at someone's credit score, right? Correct. That, Correct. That we don't consider. But we look at rent as as really an important factor. But if, if you are not able to pay your rent through no fault of your own that you don't control, then we don't hold that as a negative. Because we do character-based lending. We look to see what are mm-hmm. the extenuating, extenuating circumstances So someone says, oh, I've been applying for emergency rental assistance. I haven't been able to access that. So my rent payment is late. And obviously we use that for the purchase side, but we we say that's an exception because you've had a good rental payment history in the past. You're impacted by the pandemic. You're applying for emergency rental assistance. We're in the process of that. We're not gonna hold that as as a negative as you're going through the purchase side. 
And that's paramount that because awesome. that's one of the questions. Just so you know, you can still hit us up at 833-771-0500. And Bruce, that was actually the first question that came in out of, believe it or not, uh, Edna is coming from St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, one of the tenants asked uh, a question of, can they still uh, be considered for the character-based lending if they have blemishes on their rental? And you've already cleared that up. If it's due to the pandemic, and we have documented proof, then they can come through the NACA program. But Stephanie, I will tell you out of St. Louis, you still need to reach out to us to get the rental assistance and see what, what programs are afforded to you in your area. So Bruce, this is good information. Those of you who are, who are out there listening, you can hit us up, 833-771-0500. He's here. He has a lot of information. And Bruce, tell us, you've taken on some big giants from countrywide, Bank of America, City, Chase, Washington Mutual, you have taken on, uh, and I guess some people would say you've done the impossible because these are fights that we by ourselves wouldn't have been able to do. And this fight you're taking right now with DCA and others, how can we, what is it that you're asking us to do? What do we need to do to get involved and to make our claim and, and, and state what we want as far as the tenant is concerned? So, so there are a lot of tenants and NACA members remember we have three million members over three million members but and we work with you know not just our membership we work with the overall community right so you know people can come to NACA you know for the rental please you got to go to our website uh, at uh, NACA.com and you got to submit your information for the rental assistance so once you do that for the rental assistance then an EGA will contact you and they'll be your advocate through the process. So first step, go through the awesome. website. It also, awesome. if on the purchase side, same thing, you go to the website, then you sign up for a home buyer mm -hmm. workshop. We do them every two weeks. Mm -hmm. And that's the first step. And then you meet, you uh, will get a NACA counselor who can help you through that whole process. Same thing, NACA.com. Now in terms of what we do, do for, you know, for the, the, for the campaign, is that yes, we are gonna to go to the decision maker's home, whether, it, whether it's Christopher Nunn or other of the, of the providers that aren't doing the right thing. And we're gonna be out outside their offices, but starting on Martin Luther King's birthday, January 17th, we're gonna have 24 hour, seven day a week vigils. The wow. first one will be in front of uh, DCA, the Georgia Department of Community Affairs. And we're gonna be, and so what we're asking people to do is to sign up for a four hour slot. So we'll have 10, 15, 20, 50, 100 people out there, you know, but we want that to be 24 seven. And we're gonna be there for as long as it takes. And then that's gonna be the starting point. That's the base where we go from. Now at that vigil, obviously we're gonna get the furniture like we'd have an apartment. Obviously, we'll get the heaters. I mean, we're going to make it as really uh, um, as livable as possible on that. But it's going to be, you know, it, it, it is the winter. Even in Atlanta, it is yeah. the winter out there. But, you know, but we will accommodate on that piece. But we have to have a 24-7 uh, presence. And then, obviously, we're going to ask for a lot of people out there. We'll make sure people are fed. We're gonna make sure that you know people are supported while they're doing this. Now, this is the tenants rising campaign. So we want to start in Georgia, but we want to do it around the country, around the country. So you know that means we we want our membership and others to start these vigils. But it's not just you know a, you know three or six hours or eight hours a day. We want these vigils to be 24 hours, seven days a week for as long as necessary. Now, yes, it's tenants rising. But as we talked about, tenants rising are for tenants both having the opportunity to have a safe, affordable place to live as a tenant, but also the opportunity to buy affordable housing in, in that. And you know, one of the things that we looked at in every city I haven't found a city yet where you can go in and you can say, you know, here are all the properties that are owned by the city. You know, here are all the properties that are owned by the city. 
here is all the land that's owned by the city. Because they don't want to expose that because they want their developer friends to get access to those properties, right? So who gives them the campaign contribution? Who funds them? Well, that's the quid pro quo. That's what they want in return for doing that. But that is not for the people. So part of the Tenants Rising campaign is to look at all this land, some of the properties that need renovation and through NACA, you can purchase and you can renovate, or you can do new new construction as well to get access to that. Wow. So it's both, we want tenants and everybody to be part of these visuals so that we can have that, hold these decision makers accountable, hold them accountable. And then, you know, frankly, wouldn't it be interesting in these cities that you know, you want to know who owns the city? Who owns the city? Well, you know, yes, are there individual homeowners who own the properties in the city? Or is it the LLCs, you know, who hide behind this, you know, limited, you know, liability corporation that own it? Well, let's see that because that will show us who's, who's buying up the property, who is making it less affordable, and who's really taking advantage of the inside deals. So, wow. you know, so we want NACA to be NACA's out there saying, let's, let's uh, you know, do the uh, transparency so that, you know, what's going on in the city government is transparent. Mm -hmm. And then let's advocate to make sure that our tenants are, 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 are protected and people have the opportunity to be homeowners on, a, on affordable mortgages, affordable prices, and through NACA's Best in America mortgage. Love it. You guys throw I, some hearts up for him. Throw some hearts up for him because this is powerful information. We got some questions coming in, Damien. This is amazing. But before we do that, we got to show that video of what Let's they do were doing. Let's hey, do it. Hey, Abril, can you tee up that video? Tee we have up. an awesome this, video this for you guys. This is advocacy at its best. Let's see it. And when we come back, we have some spe other special guests on here that we want to talk to. We have EJAs on here. We have some tenants that need to talk about what's going on. April, take it away with the video. Maricopa County leads the nation in evictions, and that was the case even before the pandemic began. IFH has seen a 25% increase in single mothers facing eviction in Idaho. And tonight, new data showing evictions in Southwest Florida happening at a much higher rate compared to last year. One census tract, nearly 70% of renters are paying more than they can afford. The numbers are startling. Between 30 and 40 million households at risk of being evicted. <laughs> That video of nearly 200 people demanding their fair share of billions of dollars in rental assistance. They say it's being kept from them. Lease the funds now. They line the streets in front of the Department of Community Affairs. What do we want? Rental assistance. And chanted as one to demand the DCA release more rental assistance funds so families aren't left homeless. $47 billion and it's not getting out. And the Georgia Department of Community Affairs is one of the worst. Georgia was allocated over 700 million. According to federal data, as of September 30, the Georgia DCA has handed out only 9%. Almost all at the rally say they've been trying to get rental aid without success and are in jeopardy of losing their homes. NACA, who organized Atlanta's rally, said this is the first of many around the country. We are moving in, so we're getting this stuff ready, you know, because what we want to do is personalize what happens when someone gets evicted, when they're thrown out. This is what gets thrown out. They, all their belongings, all their personal stuff gets thrown out on the street. So, you know, we're bringing it to the street because we want to demonstrate to the Department of Community Affairs and to the state reps that, you know, this is personal and you've got to make sure that people can get access to the emergency rental assistance. Can y'all release the funds? I don't want to be a victim. They're holding our money up and won't release it. Go NACA! Hear our voices, hear our cries. The children are hungry. We are almost out in the cold and it's winter time. We need the help now. I'm a single parent of two 
and it's very important for us to be able to live and sleep properly, eat and feed our children and know that everything's gonna be okay. We need this assistance. We're here as the first demonstration of tenants any place in this country. It starts in Atlanta, Georgia with you. While we're bringing the furniture up, let me introduce the president of the Atlanta City Council, President Moore, to come on up. President Moore, and we appreciate you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for being here and showing your voices. And you're here today to demand emergency rental assistance. LaJoycelyn spent time in Iraq, in Iran, in Kuwait. She is an army veteran. Let's give her a round of applause and let's get her some help. My sister has had COVID for over 90 plus days. She had COVID as of August the 24th. And as of two weeks ago, she just got a negative result. She has been in a hospital for over six, six weeks consecutively. And every time she goes, it's a different complication. She's having difficulty breathing. She has blood clots in her lungs and everything. And she's still trying to be there for her family. She's been applying for rental assistance for over two months now. And we have not gotten a phone call back. We have not gotten an acknowledgement. The only person that will call us back is NACA, but everybody is not calling back. So let's get everybody in because it's personal and they got to hear that. If they want us here or if we need to go to their homes so that they understand that they cannot evict us. We've taken over the lobby. They heard us on the 18th, 19th floor. Now the state reps have called them into a special meeting at 2 o'clock to say, why aren't you providing the assistance? This is exactly what we wanted to accomplish and we did it. What do we want? When do we want it? Now. What do we want? When do we want it? Now. What do we want? Now. When do we want it? Now. What do we want? Now. What do we want? Now. When do we want it? Now. What do we want? Now. If we don't get it, shut it down. Wow. Amazing. Amazing. Wow. That is phenomenal work. And it just describes who we are here at NACA and the powerful thought process that goes behind yes. advocating to get real results, real resolutions. And our CEO, for those of you who are just joining, this is the American Dream Program. We have our CEO talking about tenants rising. We just saw a demonstration that showed the tenants were truly rising. And CEO, I know you have so much more that you want to talk to us about. We have an economic justice advocate that's on. Uh, we definitely want to hear from Cecily Murray. We want to hear from one of our tenants as well. And, and there's so much that, that to be discussed. But tell us, you know, what was the result from that? You talked about the results from that, that session. Now we got to take it a step further because you just normalized and made it real what happens when someone gets evicted. All of your belongings are out there on the street. All of it. That's unheard of. It's the holidays. Does Georgia have more funds to give and how can we obtain those funds at this point? So absolutely. So, you know, we, we have to continue. One of the things that we've learned over, over many years, when I started NACA 36 years ago, but every time is that, you know, these campaigns, sometimes they take time. It took us four and a half years to be pleased. Took us two and a half years to be first union, you know, and I and I can go on, but you know, and you know, some of them because some people just don't want to fight with NACA, you know, you can get it done right away. But you always have to plan for a long-term campaign because you know, you know, people have a breaking point, and you know, sometimes it takes years to get there. But if people realize that you're never going to be, you're never going to go away, you're going to be relentless. That you know, saying, "Hey, look, you know, you know, we don't want NACA on on us day and night. We don't want NACA coming to uh, where we're socializing. We don't want NACA coming to my home. We don't want NACA, you know, in, in impacting our business." And you know, so 
we got to look at this over the long term. So that's why, you know, we want these vigils. And, you know, it's not just the vigils, but, you know, we're going to put up there on uh, the screen now, you know, we want people to call Christopher Nash at a uh, nun, Christopher Nunn no. at his office. You know, so we're going to, you know, give everybody that phone number. And so, you know, we want people to keep calling him because we don't want anybody evicted anytime, but particularly during the holidays, but anytime. You and I have been talking about womanism. And so somebody in our audience may be saying, what is that? So could you give us a quick, quick and dirty definition of womanism? Basically, womanism is the intersection of a liberation theology, intersection of black theology and feminist theology, where we, where black women were left out. It is a way that we look at the world and we fight for black people, for all people, and we elevate black women, whether it's theological, literary, but it's really about black women being free to be black women and fighting for the community. The family's visit to the forest inspired a beautiful question. Mother, mother, am I a tree? You tell me to stand tall. You tell me to stay rooted. I think I am a tree. My child, my child, of course you are. But what kind of tree will you be? The kind to hug or the kind to climb? Doesn't matter what you choose, so long as you choose to be a tree that's kind. Make the forest part of your story at a park near you. Find one at discovertheforest.org. So what is what is the major hesitancies around this vaccine? Because I ask younger people all the time, you know, why haven't mm -hmm. you gotten this shot? A lot of people say, well, my mom hasn't gotten it. And so I think people are impacted by their parents and whatever reason and reasons they have for not getting it. I don't know if you heard Nicki Minaj put out information about her cousin yeah. having her testicles uh, uh, swollen yes. and of course that took off and <laughs> went viral. Yes. Can we clarify yeah. that? Can we clarify that the vaccine did not cause oh, his te oh. testicles to be enlarged? <laughs> None of that. I mean, we do yeah. have some risk associated with the vaccine, but the things that we hear out in the public aren't what they are. So, you know, and we already know that, you know, they're upset by it. They don't like what we're, that we're working with uh, the, the, with the uh, state reps. They don't like it that we're exposing where he lives and where he works. They don't like it that we're calling him constantly. And, you know, that's only the beginning. That's only the beginning. So, uh, you know, let's get everybody to keep those calls coming. Uh, people can call from any place to do that. And if we, you know, shut down the lines like we did at the Federal Reserve during the fleet campaign and their switchboard or we do whatever we have to do, we will do that. And for okay. those that are listening, where can they find the number for Chris Nunn to call? Well, well, we, we will be giving that, uh, that um, phone number out. So, Understood. so we're going to be doing that now. And then, you know, obviously the uh, economic justice advocates have it and we, we will publicize that. And that's just where his office is. We'll start to publicize his personal stuff as well. So, you know, and because he, he just not only controls, you know, the emergency rental assistance, he does section eight, he does housing towards vouchers. He does a lot of other stuff out there that we got to make sure that he is accountable and that DCA is accountable. Absolutely. So, uh, but, you know, so there's a lot of stuff that we're, you know, we've talked about today and there's a lot of stuff that is being planned that, uh, you know, we'll be talking about going forward, but it'd be great to hear from some of the EJs and from, you know, some of the tenants as well. 
Absolutely. Cecily Murray, you are our economic justice advocate. Welcome to the show. I uh, want to hear from you. Tell me, what is the role of an economic justice advocate? Well, thank you for having me on the show. I really appreciate the opportunity to, uh, you know, speak with everyone here. Um, so what, we, um, what we've been doing with as uh, economic justice advocates is reaching out to the public and, and, you know, taking the applications. But more than that, once we hear the stories, we are actually taking that information and finding ways that we can action to help uh, tenants stay in their homes. So whether that means we actually contact their landlord and, and make an agreement with the landlord, or we actually go to the county or the entity that they, they've applied for assistance with and ask for um, the status of the application, what's taking so long, how can we impact the application to make sure that the person receives assistance. Beyond that, we'll continue to fight for that tenant um, in every way that we can. And sometimes that's even meant, you know, contacting their local um, Congress people, contacting their local, um, you know, uh, county uh, officials, council members, anyone we can to uh, try to get light for our tenant and get their, their rental rents paid. Sometimes we are able to, you know, communicate with other agencies outside of just the Georgia Department of Community Affairs or, you know, the um, state departments to try to find assistance as well. So sometimes we communicate with like the Salvation Army and other agencies um, to help pay um, the rents that are due for the tenants. So um, most, of the, most of the time we're able to at least put them in front of agencies that they hadn't, you know, worked with previously. And in the case where we're working with their county officials, we're able to find out the status of the application, able to find out how we move the application forward and get them the help that they need. Um, so, so you're saying there's a pool of resources. So you don't just help with rental assistance. If there is other assistance out there, such as food, if there's other services that are in need, such as food, clothing, uh, utilities, you provide them with a smorgasbord of, of resources to better assist members that are calling in. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I've even started giving out, you know, job placement referrals because so many of my, the people I'm working with are saying like, hey, that's not, you know, gonna kind of fix the problem. Just rental assistance, I need a job, I need to work from home, I have small kids, I can't go out. My kids are held home from school because of COVID. So we've had a lot of different, you know, uh, needs arise and we've had to meet those needs in various ways. So uh, my colleagues and I, we are always <laughs> finding new information, new ways to help, being challenged. I mean, it really, it has been a challenge and it's been a lot of, rewarding challenge because I, I feel so good in being able to help the people that I've helped, um, but also in just, you know, learning different things about how, how our governments are, are basically failing um, the people and how can we fight against the, those failures? How can we fix those things? Um, and so it has been, um, it's been amazing to, to be a part of that. Now, now let me ask you this. You're located in Atlanta, Georgia, right, Cecily? Yes. Yes, I'm in it. But someone from anywhere, it doesn't matter where they are, they can contact, they can go online at www.naca and sign up for rental assistance in any state or city. Yes, is that correct? That is correct. We have all 50 states, Hawaii, we've even had Alaska. I mean, we have wow. kind of everything. And we've had to, you know, quickly study and, and, and learn the processes in each of these states. So the EJAs work extremely hard on, you know, staying abreast of what programs are available, what programs have deadlines. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely um, every state. Well, tell us about Todd. I see you have Todd Davis on the line. And so tell us a little bit about Todd. Mr. Davis was a case. He came to me, his landlord did not have any technology and refused to sign up for rental assistance, did not want to accept the rental assistance if it came through. He believed it was all a scam. And Mr. Davis was like, listen, I need these funds. He was, you know, going through some personal challenges of his own. Um, and he was just like in need of the funds and behind on the rent and, and really, you know, concerned about the welfare of his family if, um, you know, he should be evicted. And so the landlord called. I talked to him a couple of times and eventually convinced him to at least set up an email address so that we could get him an application for rental assistance. Um, you know, to, to apply with the Georgia Department of Community Affairs, he has to have an, an email address to receive the communication. And he, he eventually came around to working with one of his um, 
relatives to set up an email address to receive the uh, notifications from Georgia Department of Community Affairs. But initially, he was absolutely dead set against it. Um, beyond that, Mr. Davis also had, you know, challenges with Georgia Department of Community Affairs was the only agency servicing his uh, county, Murray County. They're the only agency that services him. So he was really about to be in a difficult situation because we couldn't find anyone else to give him funds. So we had to push with Georgia Department of Community Affairs. And Mr. Davis is um, actually one of the most persistent um, people. And that, I think that was the key to his success is that he was persistent. Mr. Davis would write emails. If I gave him a new person, if, if we talked for five minutes, he had a new idea. I mean, and when he was, you know, he had a, a time when he wasn't going to be available, he communicated that to me. And we worked with his, um, directly with his case manager. Anything he could do to try to further his case, he did it. And um, his dedication to it and his dedication to making sure that he was in touch with the right agencies, it paid off for him. It really paid off for him. And, um, you know, I was just glad to be a part of helping him to be successful in getting his rental assistance. And Todd, how, how has this program, how do you feel about this program? And what would you say to other tenants who are in need of, of similar assistance about the program and about so the Tenants Rising campaign and what calling NACA meant to you? Well, I think that it, it's definitely a great program. Um, I had never even heard of the program. And I was looking on the computer one day and, and I was very frustrated. And we had just got served with the eviction notice by a sheriff. I just got out of the hospital and I have medical condition where I have to have shots daily and if you're on the street, there's nowhere to, to, to keep a shot and there's nowhere to, to get your medical care. I take a lot of medication and, you know, it, it concerned me and I, it's, I was scared. I was completely scared. I was in the process of getting a neck surgery and a back surgery and I was in the hospital and, and she, she helped out immensely, number one, because she started the process. My landlord, the reason why he was so uncooperative was because he knew other people in Murray County and the courts and everything, and they had never even heard of Department of Community Affairs. They had no clue who it was. So they told him it's a scam. So here he was thinking the whole time <clears throat> it's a scam, and I wouldn't let up. I just kept emailing and kept emailing. I emailed everybody I could email. I contacted the governor's office. I spoke with Shannon there at the governor's office and she gave me more information on NACA um, before they even came up with Christopher Nunn's information for me. I came up with it <laughs> and I, wow. I found his email and I started emailing him and I actually emailed him one that said, if my family ends up on the street, I promise you, I will go to Washington and I will let them know who put somebody on the street after I found out that they had all this money available and they were trying to tell people, no, they don't. And, and it, it amazed me because I wasn't gonna give up. Well, make a long story short, <clears throat> I was way behind. My wife works in the medical field. And when COVID came around, it, 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 she got laid off from her job. And it took her a while to find another job. So we fell way behind. And I was in the process of trying to apply for social security. And it just, it was a mess. And I, we were able to finally get it done where I was able to hand my landlord $6,000 that came from Department of Community Affairs. Actually, they made it, they, they, they worked with, with me real well. They actually made it to where they sent it to my account. And the landlord was aware of this. They sent it to my account and I was able to just go and take and pay the, the landlord because the landlord did not want to give his personal information out. Wow. So you were able to apply the funds yourself. And Cecily, you know, here, here's the big question. 
what he's saying is that he didn't even realize who DCA was and that they had the funds available. As an economic justice advocate, are you guys hearing that a lot? That there, it sounds like CEO, there's some marketing going on. They don't know where to go to get the information, and that's just filling in the gap. Yeah, they don't. They don't tell. They, they don't give enough information. It's not widely publicized. I do see occasionally a commercial that comes up on Facebook, mm -hmm. uh, but I don't see enough advertising. Even when I'm watching television, there's no advertising mm -hmm. of DCA. So, so once again, NACA has to fill in the gap and let people know what services are out there uh, afforded to them. NACA has become the platform, the landing pad for social services in Georgia and in the surrounding states, all states. Um, that's amazing. And Todd, it's good that you got that information. CEO, um, you're filling in the gap for the marketing, for getting the word out, for contacting done, for making tenants rise, making sure they rise. Where do we go after, is, is there anything on the horizon that say NACA will be able to, to be an intermediary to, to distribute the funds? People trust NACA. They believe you're gonna do what you said you're gonna do. Can we be that, that outlet? Well, uh, let's, let's, let's push hard because there, there, there are, other, there are other, other providers who are doing a good job and I'd weigh some of the others. So let's uh, first give them the opportunity, you know, to uh, do that. Yes, if we need this to uh, every step in, like we've done in, on the mortgage side, we will do that. But let's, you know, we want to get more of the money reallocated from, you know, DCA to the other ones who, who are out of money because they did the right thing by uh, getting it out quickly and effectively. So let's, uh, you know, we're going to take this just like, you know, um, you know, uh, with NACA, we're just very effective at moving quickly. So let me give a few numbers and emails out. Okay. So for Chris Nunn, Chris Nunn, who is the CEO and the head guy at the Georgia Department of Community Affairs, his phone number is 404-679. 0585. 404-679-0585. Now, let me give you another email. This is also very interesting. This is the person, his name is Noel Payo, who runs the emergency assistance program for the federal government. He's the guy at the federal government. So let's send him some emails, okay? Because let's hold him accountable, not just for what's going on in Georgia, because remember there are other organizations and there are other providers who are doing an extremely poor job in other states, other counties, other cities. And we gotta hold them all accountable. And his email is noel, N-O-E-L dot pale. P O Y O at treasury.gov. So let me say that again. Um, Noel dot pale at treasury.gov. N O E L dot P O Y O at treasury. T R E A S U R Y dot gov. So let's send him emails. Tell him uh, your personal stories out there. And obviously, let's call Chris Nunn and tell Chris Nunn, if you don't want to respond to us now, we're going to come out and visit you. You know, and, you know, he you know, means it. and, you know, you, so that you'll have the opportunity to hear my story, hear my situation face to face. Yes, I'll, I will wear a mask. I will, you know, take the, you know, COVID protocols, but I'm coming to visit you. And please have, uh, you know, that sweet, that sweet tea and, you know. And we'll <laughs> the be, sweet Georgia tea, Bruce. Yeah, and we'll be glad to sit with you and your wife in, uh, you know, your kitchen and in your nice house. And, you know, you know, let's, let's give me the opportunity for, you know, since you refuse to do it uh, in, through your business, well, we're going to have to do it from your home. And by the way, you know, we can invite your neighbors and make it a, uh, you know, neighborhood uh, event. 
to us. Chris, if you're listening, he means it. Believe what he says. He says what he means. It's been done before. He will visit your home. He's not a stranger. So. But, 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 but remember, because I want to put it into context. I, I want to put, you know, I want to, because some people think, oh, that's going too, uh, too far. You know, that there should be a cutoff between the business and the personal. Well, how can you, how can you make that arbitrary distinction? When somebody is making decisions, they're in they they're paid for, paid very well. They're given the opportunity and responsibility to make decisions. Well, those decisions are personal because that decision could result and will likely result in the person being on the street homeless. That person, you know, you know, just like we heard from Todd, we put it that decision could put his life in danger. That's right. It could kill them. Mm -hmm. So when someone says, well, you go too far and, you know, and going to their homes, well, you know, shouldn't they be held accountable? We used to have a standard in this country called personal responsibility. Now they always say that personal responsibility is for home buyers and for low and moderate income people, working people. Well, why shouldn't that personal responsibility go to the CEOs, to everybody? And we believe it should. And then you say, what's wrong with educating their children about what their parents do? Because when they sit around the kitchen table with their nannies and everybody else, you know, serving them on, you know, doing whatever that is, you know, hardworking people taking care of their family. Well, when they sit around that kitchen table or the dining room table, I don't think it's anything. I think it's appropriate for their children to ask their parents, what are you doing? I heard that you're evicting people. I heard that you're making people homeless. I heard that you are, you know, forcing people on the street. Is that true, mom? Is that true, dad? Well, that's the conversation that should be held at the dining room table because everybody needs to be held accountable for their actions, personally accountable. And that's what NACA does in a nonviolent, but in a confrontational way that says, you got to have to respond. And we don't back off of that one iota. That's what NACA does. That's what we stand for. And we're not just going to continue to do that. We're going to double and triple down until everybody has an opportunity to stay in their home and everybody has an opportunity to be, you know, have a, be a homeowner on affordable terms, such as NACA's best in America market. That's NACA. We're both respected and we're feared, and we wear both as a badge of honor. Thank you, everybody, for the opportunity. Thank you, CEO. And as always, this is the NACA American Dream Program. Always continue to look at us on our social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can always find up-to-date information at www.naca.com. And don't forget, we are always hiring in various states and cities in your way. So please go to our careers page and take a look at it. You just heard from Cicely Murray, one of our economic justice advocates who is doing surmountable, insurmountable work. Um, in our communities. And Cecily, I want to commend you for all that you're doing out there in the Tenants Rising campaign. Keep doing what you're doing. Todd, I am so glad that you have a home and that you are back in your home where you can have a place to put your medication and things like that. And I'm, I'm so thankful that you wear the NAC, one of NACA's values is being relentless because we are. You just heard our CEO say he's not going to stop. He don't quit. He's not built to quit. It's not in his DNA and he ain't going to do it. This is the American Dream Program. Damien, the old clock on the wall say it's time for us to go. Wow. <laughs> we never have never enough, time. enough time. Never enough time. Thank never you all enough for being here. Listen, never we enough. have some upcoming things that you guys can be a part of, doing the same thing that we do, always. Yep. Be and safe. always look at the page because Tenants Rising campaign is coming and we're going to be heading in a city near you. So stay tuned. There's more to come. Thank you for joining NACA. Stay there safe.